Hello and welcome to episode 3 of our video series about creating a complete powerful application using Fine. These live coding videos are published each Thursday so be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out. In our last video we handled opening of projects. We uh, grabbed a folder from whatever data was available and that was, that was a good start. We showed how that works on, on different platforms with the same code of course because this is a platform agnostic toolkit. But this time I wanted to show how we can add support for creating a project so we actually have some data to work with in the beginning. To do this I'm going to create a setup wizard breaking the code into reusable component in a separate package so that this multi-step dialogue with navigation can be used in other areas if that's helpful. So let's open our editor to where we left off roughly last time. But before I move on to the actual content we're adding, I wanted to touch on one modification that I made since our last video. You might remember that we added some flag parsing to the command line so that we could specify the directory to open when launching the application. That code is here and it remains the same. If a project wasn't opened from the command line, we were then showing the open project dialog to allow users to choose a folder. However, that function was being called before the application ran, which can lead to complications. For example, the mobile device driver might need the application state to be able to show the more complex native open dialog. And so instead of calling it directly before the application runs, we needed to delay it ever so slightly. And to do that, we've used the lifecycle API on the application. The lifecycle allows us to hook into various important stages of the application. If we go into the detail to look at what lifecycle is, you can see that it allows us to know if something entered the foreground, exited the foreground, so if the window is active or not, and if the application started and stopped. So what we have done here was to say when the application starts, show our open project dialog. And that means that we're not going to be calling code that needs a running application to operate. It's a minor change, but it can be an important one if you're calling into operating system relative APIs that need the application to be running. Anyhow, with that, let's start work on our new dialog wizard. So I want to create a new folder for that. And I'm going to just call this dialogues. The package in the main toolkit is called dialogue, but I don't want to have exactly the same name because we'll end up with an import name clash. Inside dialogues, we'll then create a new file. Uh, and I'll just call that wizard. wizard go. Much like we did before, we will add a new type, but this time round, the package is dialogues, not main. And this package will contain various different pieces of dialogue code. We'll create a new type called wizard. Again, it's a struct, and we don't need to do a whole lot more right now. But what's important to note is that this struct is going to be public. That means it can be accessed outside of this package. And we'll also create a helper constructor function. And that will take some parameters in, but uh, for now we'll just leave it. And that will return a wizard object so that people can operate on this wizard from wherever it's being used. And we can currently just return an instance of this type. Now, you'll notice these are public APIs, like I said, and they could be accessed from our project, but they can also be accessed from anywhere that has um, knowledge of our source code location, which might not be desirable. This may just be functionality that we want to make useful inside our project. That being the case, I'm going to create a new folder called internal, and that needs to be at the top level of our application. move that to the top and place dialogues inside internal. 
yes, let's move that. So you can see now Dialogs exists inside the internal folder. And what that means is that although all of our code can access these public APIs, they're not available outside the project. I'm definitely a fan of making sure that APIs aren't more publicly available than they really need to be. We can always make them more public later, but it's a lot harder to move a public API to be private after the fact. Okay, so let's think about what the wizard is going to have inside it. Well, I guess it's going to have um, a title. That will probably just be a string. We'll display that at the top of the wizard. And we're going to have multiple different stages. That's, I guess, what a wizard dialogue is. So essentially, when we add something new to our dialogue, we want to move it onto a, a stack so that then items could be taken off later. So if we make a stack, this could be of anything actually. So we'll, any graphical objects, we'll call this a slice of canvas object. That's pretty much all that we need to know to be able to get this started. Um, let's pass these in through the constructor, but let's not pass an entire stack. Let's instead just set up the content that we'll get started with. So that would be a single canvas object, not a slice of them. And we pass that in to a wizard. Um, let's, let's just uh, set up a new variable here, pass in the title. And we can set the stack to be a new slice of um, canvas objects containing our content. And that has set up the internal state. Um, but we're going to want to display this, of course. So somehow we're going to need to set up the visibility, the, the object hierarchy. Um, so the current visible item We'll need to store that. So let's um, call that the, the current, well, the content, I suppose. And that, um, it will be any object, but actually we're going to want to change the content. So instead of trying to keep track of it, we'll, we'll put a container in there. Any container, doesn't have to be specified just yet. Uh, and that means that we can change the children objects visible quite easily. So then we'll set the content of the wizard to be a new container. Um, I'm going to use new stack. In theory, just about any container that has items that fill the space would be okay. Um, stack, I think, most fix the bill here. We could put things on top of each other if we wanted to, or we could just replace it completely. And that takes the content that we passed in as the thing that's going to fill its space just now. So we have a wizard it's set up, and in theory, there's some content in it. Um, but we're going to want to present it on screen somehow. Now, this could be part of a container uh, that being configured as part of a wider content, something embedded in the UI. Um, but in this case, we're setting up a dialogue. That's why it's in the dialogue package. So let's wrap um, uh, just a standard dialogue. In fact, again, we'll just put the generic interface type in there so that we can figure out how the dialogue functions. And that allows us to keep track and utilize an existing piece of code, the dialogues that have been set up as standard, and we can put our content into it so we don't need to handle the overlays and the styling of popped up content. So I suppose the, the next thing there would be, how do we show our content? So we can add a new function to the wizard. Let's call it show. <laughs> Pretty standard naming, I suppose. To show a dialog um, with find they appear in a specific window rather than in a brand new window. So we will pass in the window that uh, we want it to display in. And that pretty much is, is everything. So we're going to want to essentially piggyback, I suppose, a dialog 
uh, we created a reference here called D um, for the dialog we're wrapping. So we'll just set that up. There's a reasonably recent function in the dialog package called new um, custom without buttons. And that essentially gives us almost complete control over what's in the dialog. We give it a title because there's a standard layout. So we can pass the title that we already know. And the rest of it is up to us. So we just pass in the content. That's pretty easy. And then lastly, we'll just need to say what window it is that it should be displaying. Which is what we passed into this function. Okay. That seems like it's that. So then we can actually then show the dialog that we've just configured. While we're here, why don't we allow it to be hidden as well? So that when we're done, it can go away. As we have wrapped a dialog, that's going to be pretty straightforward. We just need to call hide on the dialog type that we have wrapped. Right? Well, I mean, it's relatively primitive. We've not done anything with the stack yet, but we'll certainly come back to that shortly. But why don't we use this dialog that we have created? I'll go back to main and instead of calling open project dialog directly, let's, let's set up our wizard instead. So um, to do that, I suppose um, we are going to want to maybe create a new method. So um, <clears throat> create, and we'll need to pass the window that we want it to appear in so we can use it later. That's just W here. So as this is going to be part of our UI code, we will go to the GUI file and add it. So let's add that to the end of the existing file. And we call that show create, excellent suggestion there. And the window was being passed in. So now we're going to instantiate the dialogue that we created. So we could do that pretty easily. We'll just call new dialogue, um, sorry, we'll call new wizard. And pass in the title, which we'll set to um, create project. And we'll need some home content, which we'll set up in a moment. And the wizard will be shown by passing in um, the window. Now, it's not managed to find that. I suppose I should really have um, given it a help by saying dialogues.newwizard. If we save the file now, it should resolve the problem. And you can see it's imported here our own package in the internal dialogues package. So all that remains then is this home content that we haven't created yet. Uh, so what could that be? Well, for now, I suppose it could just be a label. Um, here you can create a new project. And we could put in some uh, new lines, I suppose, uh, and tease perhaps that they could also open. Earlier. Okay, that will probably do for now. Um, so that is our content that will be passed in here. Um, oh, sorry, wrong type of string for new lines. We'll do a raw string and unindent that there. So that's going to pass it exactly as is with these new lines, which the label supports quite happily. And that should dismiss that warning. Okay, cool. So we might be good to go. Let's open a terminal once again. Oh, hi there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was playing with uh, 
terminal prompt earlier. So then we can just go run our project. And it's going to open the window with our dialogue. Here you go. So it's used the existing um, dialogue look and feel. It's placed the title, which we told it, and inserted our content into this window. Of course, that's not particularly useful yet. We're going to need to add some functionality to this so that we can use the wizard. So let's go back to the code and maybe just drop two buttons in there, one for opening existing and one for creating new. <clears throat> so this, uh, I suppose, would be the intro text now. And our home content would be a little bit more complex. So um, it would be a new container. Um, we're going to put intro content above and then some buttons at the bottom. So that seems like a vertical box with intro and buttons. Buttons, this will be a um, horizontal um, set of, uh, yeah, two buttons in a horizontal container. Um, but let's let's make sure they're equal size. So it, yeah, it just creates a, a nice UI. So to do that, we'll use a grid a new grid with columns, that's with two columns. And let's say um, open versus create. Yeah, okay, so then we need to make these two new buttons. Um, so open, that will essentially replicate the functionality we had before. So new button, um, that will say open um, project. And the function there, we don't need to make a new function because we already have um, open project dialog. So that should go ahead and just open the code we had already. We'll make a new button called create. A new button there, uh, create project. And that, again, I think, um, can, oh, right, what that does is um, nothing right now. We don't have that code yet. That's going to want to step into the next part of the dialog. So let's make um, a new function for that. Uh, show create step. Does that make sense? Um, possibly. I think we're going to need to know the wizard to be able to do that um, code because we're going to want to pop something into it. So actually we need to have this wizard variable declared earlier. Let's just pop that at the top of the function. It is kind of the intent. Ah, now we see there's kind of a, a construction loop. We want to create the wizard with home content, but the home content wants to create, call a function um, that is going to access the wizard. So which order do we create them in? Let's, let's put it back down there. And we can finish setting up the home content. And this create step, um, how, are we going to, how are we going to do that? Uh -huh. Okay, so what we can do, instead of setting up the wizard right away, we can just declare a variable that um, is of the right type so that's um, dialogues.wizard. And then instead of implicitly creating it here, we just assign the variable. So now the wizard will be available. We can't use it right here, but we can open a new function and um, do whatever func work was going to be useful. By the time it executes, this wizard variable will have been set. So just to um, demonstrate that, I suppose. We can um, work to pop some item into the wizard. Um, so let's just call that step two for now, I suppose. Step two. Um, and to 
put that into the wizard, we'll, we'll need to create a function, I suppose, to make this happen. But in theory, we could just do wizard.push um, our label, which, oh, I didn't give a name. Step two, uh, step two. That's in theory everything, but I think each step of the wizard probably wants a title. Um, so let's call that step two content. So in theory, that is everything okay, apart from we don't have anything called push in our wizard. Okay, well, that's where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. So let's go ahead and create that new um, new function here um, called push. So we were thinking then that it would have a title and content. Again, just a canvas object. It's not going to return anything. It's, it's just going to go ahead and push it onto our stack. So what, what does that look like? Well, we did define the stack already. So we can um, append to that. That means that we can keep track of which things happened before, which will be super useful in just a moment. And our content could go here, but actually what we want is more than just pushing new things on because we want to automatically handle the flow. Uh, so new items being pushed into a wizard uh, should have a back button and display the title in there, I think. That would be a good start anyway. So instead of just displaying the content, um, let's, let's wrap that in the UI that we want to see added. Uh, can't think of a better name right now, so we'll just call that wrap. It's a private function on this wizard, which we'll create here. Wrap, and that's going to take the content canvas object and return a different canvas object that, that contains the complete UI. Um, I suppose you could call it Chrome. The, the stuff that goes around the outside of what we have, have passed in to make it interactive. So to do that, um, we want to put a, like a title bar type of thing um, on the top, which is a back, uh, a back button and the title uh, with everything else underneath it. So overall, that's, that's a border layout like we saw back in episode one. So we can return a, a container.newBorder and that's going to have a thing called uh, navigation, I suppose, at the top. This takes four or five parameters. So top, uh, bottom is nil, left and right are both nil for now. And then we want the content. Okay, so then we just need to declare the, the navigation bar. And that sounds like um, a horizontal box. So container.new h box. Um, let's put the button to go back. So that's a new button. Um, but let's use the version of a button that has an icon. And I don't think we need any text on a back button. We can just use the themes um, navigate back um, icon. Uh, oh, not next, sorry, back. And then that needs a function what does what does back do um, I suppose because we have the stack all we want to do is remove what we've just added um, and refresh it to the previous state so that's I mean that's the opposite of push that we added earlier that's that's pop so we'll have a pop function let's, let's come back to that in a minute um, and the other part of the title bar is the label um, new label um, which is going to include the title. Yeah, okay. Um, and we can just close that off there. I think, yeah, I forgot that we wanted to wrap this with a title, um, which should be available. Um, yeah, it was push, passed into push and we just didn't use it. I think if I saved the file, it would have warned me of the unused variable there. Um, saving that now, the only problem is this missing so let's just add that in here. 
roughly trying to keep these um, methods in alphabetical order. Seems like once a file gets large, it's a bit easier to, to find them. Uh, so the pop, uh, I guess we're going to do a little bit of um, slice manipulation here. So the stack, instead of being appended, um, it gets shortened, doesn't it? So that would be all of the items into the stack up to um, the second last one, which I suppose is the length of the stack, um, minus one. Now, it is possible that that would panic, I suppose, if um, if the stack wasn't long enough. So let's just do a quick check there. Um, if length of stack is um, less than or equal to one, um, we can't pop anything. We'll be left with an empty stack. Well, I suppose you could pop one item off it, but we don't want to because we, we always want to leave that home content. So we'll just return from here if there's only one item left on the stack. Uh, and then we're going to um, want to update what's displayed, which I'm realizing now we didn't do on the push. We just appended the stack. We didn't actually change what was visible. So let's rectify that in both places. You'll remember that we made a container called content before. And I can just update that easily by specifying a new slice of objects to go and uh, fill that container. So let's construct a new slice um, by telling it uh, the top of the stack, which would be the item in the stack at the end. So that would be length of um, w dot stack again, minus one. It's a little confusing for up there, but this time we're indexing it inside what's there and that was to end it which is exclusive instead of inclusive. I, I hope I'm right about that <laughs> and then we'll just refresh our container. Uh, so that will update our look with the new topmost stack item and we can do approximately the same thing in pop. So here we're going to want to set it to um, actually, I guess it's the same because we've already popped the item from the stack. If we wanted a wizard that could go forward without any change, we could have left the stack as it is and kept a, an index pointer to where in the stack we are so you could go backwards and forwards. And at that point, we wouldn't only want to display the item at the end of the stack. Um, but for now, that's okay. We're just using it for backwards history, not, not forwards as well. So now our pop function um, exists we should be we should be good to go actually so we've added that and we go back save this and go back to the main file uh, oh sorry the GUI file is where we were wasn't it so push is now uh, looking like it should work obviously so much of this could be unit tested um, I didn't want to get into testing quite this quite this early on um, the wizard is quite a large component and if we introduce testing at this stage it's going to seem a little bit overwhelming um, but in what I think two episodes time we're going to look at custom components and extending existing widgets they're much more concise and will be easier to introduce unit testing so now we have our wizard opened up with the two buttons that we saw open project and create project and the create should uh, introduce a second step and there it is step two content and our back button is going to pop us back again well that's very exciting um, but we don't really want the dialogue to keep changing size so let's look at what we can do there um, when we show this dialogue let's um, let's resize it as well so uh, dialogues can just be resized by um, passing in a new size like a, a window. Uh, I don't know what the exact numbers are here. Um, let's just make something up for now and see how it looks. Uh, maybe about that. Um, but the resize method doesn't exist. Wow, another method to go and implement. So we've wrapped dialog, which means that we need to uh, implement that to pass the information through. Uh, so we'll put that here as well. 
um, and we're calling that resize and it takes a size doesn't return anything and we're going to um, just resize the dialogue with that past information and I suppose we, we um, might want to just be a little bit uh, safe here because our dialogue isn't created until it's shown so it's possible that um, it could be nil so we don't don't really want to do anything about that yet there which is avoiding a potential panic and now when we run the dialogue oh is it is it um, possible maybe that I passed a size that was no larger than it already was so let's let's go up a, a step or two um, let's see how that looks there we go probably too high now um, but not quite wide enough you can see it's still uh, shrinking so our uh, requested size isn't quite enough sorry about the kind of the, the guessing here uh, we could do the same thing um, that was done earlier in this series and put a layout in there print out the size or we could um, ask how much space is required by getting the minimum size for our home Let, we could look at that actually I suppose in a second um, so here we have something that's clearly bigger than necessary and is staying consistent. Uh, this home screen is actually the largest of the items in our dialogue so instead of doing this specific number passing we could do what I suggested before and ask for the minimum size of our home screen and set the wizard to be that size but it does have um, space around it it's not just measuring the the inside because the, the borders and things around it uh, so we would need to add something to that size um, add width height uh, I'm guessing the height is more because it's got a title bar so there's still a couple of magic numbers here unfortunately um, they could be multiples of theme padding or, or something like that but we're really just looking for something consistent and uh, I didn't make the height big enough that's obviously way bigger than I thought with the, the padding so let's up these, let's just make it 18 and 40 for now and we'll demonstrate that it's working just fine. Just fine. Oh, did I still not make it high enough? Is that right? Width, height, oh, I put them the wrong way around. The width is a smaller amount added. The height is what needs the larger amount. There we go. So slightly magic numbers. Um, we, we can come back to that and improve it later. One other thing I just thought would be nice to do would be to change how these buttons look. Um, make one a little bit more important. Uh, but also let's test this open project. And it shows it, fantastic. Um, we can still go back to here. Um, however, when we actually open a project um, like this, the dialogue is still open. So we do need to um, do something about hiding the wizard if that was the option that was chosen. So let's go back to our buttons. Uh, this create button, this is the one that I thought should be more important. Um, so importance, let's make that high, um, high importance. Uh, I think if you're on a, on a slightly older version, I find that would be the um, button importance, but it's now generally used in other places. So we made it a, just a generic widget importance. And the um, open button, um, let's let's just say, hmm, should it call that directly? Uh, for now, let's just take that out and put in a new function. Oops, uh, I think I'm on the, confused what type of keyboard I'm using today. So let's just go back and um, actually copy the old code or cut it out rather make a new function and before we open that dialogue we will dismiss or hide our wizard that seems slightly better if they go back it's not there anymore um, we can we can certainly work on that 
Uh, okay, let's have a look. That looks nice. Our crate is now the primary thing to do. And open is going to go to this project open. We'll go there and it's a completely usable and we can still go and open our project from the menu item like before. Excellent. So I suppose what we really want to do is actually now be able to create a project. So we'll need to put much more interesting content here. Uh, so that will perhaps be um, project details. And instead of this really trivial item, let's make a new function that creates the content much like uh, we created the dialogue in this function. Uh, so we'll say make um, create uh, detail. That probably works as a, as a name. So we can push that there and that's all that we need to do here. Let's, I suppose, uh, add that function. And we work on jQuery, make, create detail. Um, as far as I can remember, that's just going to uh, return a canvas object because that's the content to display. I don't think it's taking in anything. Uh, what we're going to do is display a form and uh, execute some code when that form is completed. So let's um, let's dive in then. I suppose with with the details that that would that would entail. We're going to want to know. <clears throat> The name of the project, uh, that's going to be important, um, and where to store it. Let's, let's just start with, with those two items, I suppose. So, um, that might be every... Yeah, I, I think we could, we could use a form widget here. So, the um, widget. New form. And uh, that takes form items. Form item, uh, which is a label and a content, so the kind of like the input that you want to have next to the label. So the label would be a name, I suppose. And that will be the, we'll just, yeah, we'll create that later, the name input. Uh, and then form item for the uh, parent directory. Seem like it's possibly right. Um, we'll just call that dir. So to make that compile, we need to create the uh, entry for name. New entry, that's pretty straightforward. The directory, um, that's, let's make that a, um, a button. So when they uh, tap the button, we can open uh, a folder. Yeah, that's right, we'll open the parent folder so that we can create this new folder inside it. New button. Um, so we'll need to figure out what the name of the, the default directory is and the function. Um, we'll need to open um, a dialog do we want to have a default? Yeah, I mean, it would make sense to have a default directory, I, I expect. Um, parent. Um, what, would the, what would the default be? So we're going to use um, listable URIs again. Uh, so that we can use these folders from, from whatever system they come from. Um, but where where would we choose? I suppose um, the user's home directory is one option. Let's go with that. So I think um, there's user home there, and that gets a string or error. Um, 
Actually, I don't think we can do much with that, or at least not right now. There may be a sensible fallback, uh, but if it can't be found, there's a good chance we're not going to encounter that. If you're running a piece of graphical software on a desktop uh, or a mobile device, the user is going to exist and they'll have a home directory. So then um, we'll get the uh, URI, new file URI uh, from that path. Um, and then we'll need to make it listable, which is, um, I think we saw last time, um, lister for URI, we pass in the parent, and that one can error as well, um, but it's a parent directory, the user's home directory is, is always going to be a directory, so I'm, I'm going to ignore that one as well. Um, at some point, of course, we could look at uh, a good logging setup and how we could uh, record this and make sure that we're not missing possible errors in the user's code journey. Um, that was a really daft name though. Um, chosen. Um, let's go with that. Uh, we've created the directory, so let's um, set the text uh, to be, oh, we don't, need to, we don't need to set text. We have the text when it's created here. So chosen.name. We can do that. Um, the form is being set up and we could return this form. That's fine. We've got a default mm, directory. Our project name. Uh, just want to validate that before we submit, I suppose. Um, so we can do a, an interesting built-in function of form here and use the on submit function. Um, by having an on submit, the submit button of form will appear. So we set that to be a function here. And what we're going to do is um, check that the name is not blank. So um, if the name was empty, or rather, sorry, if the name's text, the text of the entry widget, if that's empty, um, then there's not much we can do. The form is not ready, so we'll just uh, return from there. Um, and then here, just another quick to do, um, set up project. And then it would, I suppose, um, dismiss the wizard. So um, we would hide that wizard. We don't know what it is though, this create um, detail. We didn't think anything needed to be passed in. Um, dialog wizard. Um, so that just needs to be passed in oh, here. Again, it's the variable for wizard um, that's going to be created later. We're inside a delayed execution function. So like how we hit the wizard here, we can pass it here. And the actually set up instance will be passed into that function. Okay, cool, getting there. Um, sorry if this is a little bit dense. There's quite a few things I suppose to actually setting up project creation. Um, I think this is, is not too bad though. We'll, we'll just drop in some code here for choosing a directory and then we can break out the actual functionality for, for creating the project here. Never like it if a function is more than a, a screen's worth. In fact, mm, prefer it if it's much shorter. It's not always possible especially when you're building front-end code, I suppose. So um, to do this, we are going to open the um, folder open dialog like we did before. Um, dialog to new folder open. We're going to do a little bit of work with it this time. Um, so we're going to keep a reference to it and show it when we're ready. We'll need a function much like last time that takes the um, listable URI and the potential error, and let's make sure that we handle them. So um, if there's an error choosing, we just won't do anything, we'll, we'll return. So if the error uh, was not nil, um, or if the user cancelled in its case, that would be an error as well, because it's not optional, but uh, we can fall back to the default, which we had set already. So we'll just return. Then if we have found one, then this listable URI goes uh, set to chosen. 
excellent. Um, what else do we need to change? That's going to be used later. Um, ah, the name of this uh, listable URI should be set to the bottom. So in theory, we just do this. We just set text to l.name. But as you'll see, we've got this um, import loop again. Let's first just fix the issue with uh, D and come along. So the folder open, really it should default to whatever folder we chose before uh, instead of always being the same um, default location. So we can set the location of the dialog to be what had already been chosen. And then we would be ready to show it like any other dialog. So that should be that. Aha, um, there's a missing parameter here. I forgot to pass the window, um, which will be the window for our GUI. And now we're down to the directory can't be referenced because it hasn't been set up. Um, so I can do the same thing as we did before, which is to declare a variable that is our directory button called, uh, sorry, of type widget.button and then set it instead of creating it automatically. And now that variable will be set by the time our callback function executes. Uh, again, sorry if this seems a little bit um, confusing or spaghetti. Uh, it's only one way to do it. Uh, we'll look at other ways, I suppose, um, by having structs that store all of these variables as they're set up. But this is really helpful to do such inline things on a fairly regular basis. So it's a pattern worth knowing. We have now opened, we've chosen a name, uh, we're ready to go. So we could indeed um, go ahead and, and create the project. That would probably not be um, a GUI function, uh, but let's just um, well, figure out where to put it later. But for now, we'll create project um, with the name, uh, the text, sorry, name, name was our entry widget. So the text will be the name of the project and the directory, uh, well, that was the um, the parent directory, sorry, uh, we stored that in chosen. And I'm guessing that such a thing might error. Uh, so uh, we'll handle what an error might be. Uh, and if um, the error was not nil, uh, we will need to do something uh, we can. Let me think, that would be, uh, yeah, a user facing error. So we'll use the same dialog um, that we saw before, dialog to show error, and we'll just pass it um, the error, the window, which again is, is g.win, and in that case we want to uh, return from this form submission without uh, wrapping up, without feeling like the, pro the flow is completed, so our dialog will still be here and the user can revise, maybe there was a name problem, maybe the parent directory wasn't writable, uh, so we've exited. exited. Uh, if we didn't exit, it went successfully. We can hide the wizard, but also we can open the project. So let's just quickly refresh our minds. Open project was the function that we called. So inside our um, GUI code, we can do exactly that. Uh, we called it G uh, because we're in one of the GUI functions. And that would then be the um, result of creating. Um, so that hasn't actually been set. So we would need to um, assume that it returns from create project. So we could comment this out quickly and see how the code runs. Um, but let's actually just stub this out. I said this wasn't really part of the GUI, which I mean, well, it depends, I suppose, but let's for now separate it to a different folder. Project.go. Um, still in package main this time. We don't have a reason to separate this out into a, into a separate place. Uh, let's just make this basic function create, I think, um, was what it was called. The name, just string. Parent was a um, listable listable URI, and we figured that the return would be the new directory, the listable URI, um, 
find an error, potentially an error. And for now, uh, we can just return nothing for the positive result and a new error, errors.new um, failed, maybe not failed, uh, incomplete. <laughs> and that's going to import the errors when I save. We'll go back here, create project is what I called it. Well, that wasn't quite right. Create project, save again, go here. Okay, I think our code is ready to go. So let's just run this again and see where it takes us to. Nothing new here, we create the project. Uh, so the dialogue now needs to be taller. We can come back to that. Um, we'll give this project a name temporary. The parent directory is my home directory, but if I chose to put it in the code directory, then there we go, that's working. It's going to create a temporary project in the code folder. And I could submit that, but let's just check our empty test first. So it's doing nothing because the, the, that's empty. We could use validation there, that would be much better. Let's look at that. Uh, but before then, temp encode submit there we go, uh, an incomplete. That's what we were expecting and the dialogue didn't go away. Great. Um, let's just quickly see if we can improve that, uh, that check. So our entry for name, we've done nothing with it at all, uh, but we could actually set up validation on the entry instead of having to write this code here. So name.validator uh, um, uh, validation, there's a validation package um, that will be really helpful here. Uh, is there um, a helpful um, password? I don't know if we have a new empty string. Well, ah, yes, because what we want is for that to be a required string. That, there's an API discussion about why that doesn't exist and we're going to find a nice way to make that easier because we could just mark the field as required and then empty wouldn't be okay. But for now we're going to need to uh, quickly add our own one I expect. Let's just have a quick look at how validators work. Um, it's a little helper function returning a function that is matches string validator which is a very simple prototype here a function that takes a string and returns an error. So we actually could pass this in ourselves. We could set up a new empty validation um, that returns an error if, um, if in is equal to empty string return errors.new um, project name is required. So we have set up the validator here. Um, in the positive case, return nil. As with good Go code, your happy path would be on the left. And an error case, we're checking for an error state, returning the error so that we can continue. And here, all we do is return nil. That is the happy path. So if we run this same code again, then you'll see a slightly stretched out form. That's kind of bizarre. We can put our name there and a tick appears. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but this form was uh, not submittable before because it was empty. See, that's disabled. In fact, if we go to a different input field, it's saying, ah, no, it can't, can't be empty. So we'll do that and then we can submit our project. That's nice. It means that what we can do is take out our empty string check from this function because our form is enforcing the presence of a name. Of course, if this was a web UI with an API on the back end and you're passing the data through, you wouldn't want to rely on front end logic to do your validation. But because we're controlling the logic here in our front end, it's probably safe to allow the validator to do the check and give the user some pretty solid feedback in the case where um, they didn't match you know, the expectation. Okay, so I suppose all that really 
remains is to actually do something about creating this project. So before we wrap up the video, let's just see if we could do something super quick to set this project up. Um, so we're going to want to uh, return a new directory that we've created. So um, let's figure out what the, um, the directory would be first, I suppose. So we've got to ask what, um, what a child directory would be for the parent, given that name. Um, this is, I suppose, the equivalent of um, file path uh, concatenation or joining, sorry. So we can ask for the child um, of a parent, uh, given this name. And that is, okay, technically it could fail. Um, and we are we're handling errors pretty well here, so let's return um, an error if that's the case. I can't think what a failure to understand the name of a child item would be, but it's possible that we accidentally are no longer listable or something along those lines. So we can return nil and that error. Okay, now we have the the, um, the URI for that directory. Um, we're going to want to um, create it. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Um, and we're going to create it as, as listable. So um, storage, we use create listable and that's creating a new listable um, storage instance under the URI specified, and it could return an error as well. And that it seems like a peculiar way to describe it. I mean, create listable when really we want to just make a directory, but we don't know what type of data or location is represented by the parent URI. And so the child that we create needs to be of a similar thing. It could be, a folder in a web dev collection. It, it could be um, an item in a database. Like the abstraction here means we don't know, we don't have complete um, control and we can't assume a file system uh, location that you might normally. Again, uh, if we can't create that, um, we're gonna have to return. Now, if we get to here, we have actually created the folder uh, so that's that's pretty good news. Um, what uh, what will we do with with that information? Um, let's let let's just put a small file into that location. Um, we could, I suppose, um, put a, uh, a go dot mod. That might be a start. So we want to write a file. Um, so the, if the module file um, has a different name, then we need to use storage.child again to understand the name, uh, uh, sorry, the URI for the name. And this time the parent is our directory and the name is go.mod. Um, so now we have the module, if it worked, um, again, if not, um, Turn the error. Then we can write into this module file, um, probably not using the file system utilities because again, this is an abstraction. We could be writing into a database entry or um, something other than a file on the local system. So we will use the storage package one more time uh, to get a writer to that location. So we call writer and pass it in the mod. That's going to return an IO writer um, and a potentially an error. So we'll do one more error check. Of course, we are assuming at every one of these steps that each error means that the project couldn't be created. Um, there's probably a bit more nuance there, uh, but for now that's probably safe enough. Um, and now we will uh, write a string uh, into the writer, and that string would be something like um, module uh, tests, or yeah, we could actually put the name in. So we'll pass in the name, um, a version of Go that it depends upon, like 1.17, I think is what cur currently is um, the minimum for fine. 
and we can add the require line um, for fine because obviously the project they're creating is going to be a fine project, fine v2, um, and the latest version for that as well is 2.4.0 and a nice new line at the end. Uh, because we're passing in the name, we will do that here. Um, right string. Oh, that's not quite right. We need to um, can just do that as s print f for printing into a format. Pass the name, and that um, is pretty much that. I think uh, we have an open writer, which is uh, actually a write closer. So we should definitely defer closing it. So we'll defer that close, which means that we can simply return um, the error from there and the directory. So um, directory and error. However, the right string is, I think, going to trip me up. Um, multiple value right string uh, returns an a number, that's right. Uh, I thought there was something funny going on there. So the writer can um, tell us how many bytes or um, runes were written. Uh, so actually, we don't just have an error returned, we have the number which we ignore. Um, and so then we can return that error along with the um, directory. Uh, let's put your right error. Ooh. Almost, almost, we're so close. Um, but actually, the URI that I'm trying to return there is not a listable URI. We know it is listable because we created it as listable and there wasn't an error, but the type isn't quite right. So we will just get um, a listable version of that and ignore the error this time because we know that is not going to error, or we can be pretty certain. Um, a more robust coder may choose to handle that error correctly because you never know when things change. But there we go. So we're creating um, the folder. We're creating a Go mod. We're writing some text into it and then returning the location that we created the um, file in. So jumping back one more time, we are um, then going to handle the error if there's an error. Otherwise, hide the wizard and open the project. Okay, so um, I don't know if it's a fingers crossed or just be hopeful moment, uh, but let's see how that works. So we have our application here. We're going to create the project and yeah, we can look at dialog sizing um, before next time. Um, testing folder, I'll just leave it in the Andy folder for now. Submit. Okay, this is interesting. You'll remember from episode two that we use data binding to update this content and the title bar um, of our application to represent testing, uh, sorry, to represent the project name when we loaded it and here that's testing. So that's looking good. And if I actually just list um, the testing folder in my home directory, it has a go.mod. Okay, this is really looking good. Um, and we can cut that. And there we go. It has the module it's testing, it has go 1.17, and it requires fine. So we have actually successfully opened a project. Uh, sorry, we've created a project and then opened it. That is a big step along the way. Obviously, we didn't see much on screen. Uh, that's that's all for today. I feel like that's, that's quite a journey. Um, but next time, we're going to look at how we can use that um, information, the files created, to start showing files and folders inside our um, a folder panel. And we'll look at previewing the files that we've created as well. So hopefully that's a little bit of a teaser. Don't forget to um, subscribe to this channel so you don't miss out on the next item. If you want to learn more, of course, you can still go to the application uh, homepage where we're <clears throat> advertising what's going on and the latest information, that's fission.app. And you can go there and see any recent changes. You'll find that uh, since last time, it links to a page called Creating an App Builder. And that page is just a list of the videos and the screenshots of where we got to each time. So do feel free to visit that 
if you think that maybe you have missed a video along the way. Well, thanks so much for your attention today. Have fun, and hopefully I'll see you next week. Goodbye.